Will, I have to tell you, yes. your voice is in my house <laughs> and in my ears too much. I'm so sorry. Uh, it, it's I mean, it's wonderful. <laughs> I want to talk to you about it a little bit because so wait, I can you always know- recognize it? Is it is yeah. always it's just Will enough? I can hear it from another room. And I'm like, is that Will? And I'll think I'm wrong. I'll think I'm wrong because there have been times I've watched other animated shows and I thought I've recognized the voice from like a different one. Like Adler loves the show called Super Wings. And yeah. then we were watching a show, um, a Disney Channel animated show. And I was convinced that one of the Super Wings was a voice on this animated show. And I looked it up and it was not. And I was like, man, I really thought I was going to nail that. Somehow with Will's voice, <laughs> even when he's changing it as characters, I can like hear it enough. And it doesn't matter where I am in the house. I was giving Keaton a bath the other night and Adler was watching Guardians of the Galaxy on his Amazon fire. And from the other room, I go, is that Will? And Jensen's like, I don't know. Let me look it up. And he looks it up. He goes, yeah, it's Will. And then we were watching a Spider-Man, an ultimate Spider-Man on TV another day. And all, all of a sudden from the other room, I'm making Adler's dinner. Is that Will? And so Jensen texts, Will, Will, are you in the ultimate Spider-Man? He goes, is it a Deadpool episode? And we're like, it is. He goes, then, yep, it's me. I'm like, oh my God. And then I'm listening to the, our podcast episodes for, you know, doing our editing. And then I'm watching Boy Meets World for the, and I'm like, there is so much Will. Will is just everywhere. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I mean, it's wonderful. I had no idea. I knew you were a very successful voiceover actor, but I did not know quite how many characters you voice. It's like tons. Yeah, I've been very, I've been very, very lucky in my voiceover career. And, and it, it's hundreds now at this point. I've been oh doing gosh. it for 25 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's been, so cool, it's man. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous side of the industry. It really is. Well, I'd love to escape you. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to mute you, you. turn you off. That's a conversation between Ryder and Danielle. Today's episode. That is no problem. I totally understand. Uh, but just make sure you don't watch any Thundercats or Batman of I'm, any kind and you'll be fine. Okay. But Will, how often do you do like your voice? I mean, how often is it just you acting and how often is it a character? Um, It depends on what world we're in quote unquote like right. disney you know if you're doing something disney you are very charactery you're usually it's like ron stoppable is always up here and it's not you know it's total character um right. but when you're doing something like um guardians of the galaxy it is kind of just me it's like a chris pratty kind of yeah oh come on gamora what, what are you talking about let's just go and do what we got to do you know so right. it's like, right, that right. It's like a slightly thing. elevated version of yourself exactly so right. you do you do you know and then and then it runs the different kind of depending on what you're doing i mean i just did one uh what was it last week where the whole time i'm just talking like this oh that's great i like that's that so fun. Like, is that a prospector <laughs> yeah he was he was kind of <laughs> like oh, i'm just out here just with my horse and just trying to figure out how to get to the gulch you know like stuff That's like amazing. that so, see uh, i um i my voice never changed so uh i i i oh the only cartoon characters i ever have gotten cast in is 14 year old boy because i just sound like a 14 year old boy so it's, it's a great it's, zone it's to be a great in living guys boy, yeah, i'm not gonna lie voice so i just area, show up great. and sort of act as this and it's and you know i've had people say to me like recognize me on the street and they're like your voice hasn't changed i'm like yeah i, know, I still sound like i did yeah, thank you. season season one of boy meets world that was it guys <laughs> I, was, I stopped growing so i'm the same height five eight and my voice never changed well can we talk about that for a second because i know we're going to get back into the episode but the, or into the episode when we get there but the thing that shocked me the most about this episode was how much you towered over ben over- yeah <laughs> Like I never knew. Yeah. I always in my head, you're kind of like the same size. You were like a foot taller than him. Well, I this, think it was also just the way I was like perching in this episode. Like I'm constantly like sitting on a desk above, like even sitting on the back of my seat. For some reason in this episode, I'm like constantly. Yeah. yeah but you, uh, but you, you get like in his face. You get into his face at the end and you're like, you tower over him. Yeah. Well, this is why I didn't realize that I was not a tall person until I was in my twenties. <laughs> just like, just like I didn't really, I just, just like I didn't know my uh, shirt size until I was 20. Uh, I always, because, because at 13, I was the tallest kid in my class. You know, like I was always oh, okay. taller than all of my friends. So when we started Boy Meets World, like I was locked in this mindset of like, Oh, I'm kind of a tall person. And then everybody, Everybody else kept growing, kept growing and, and I yeah. did not. Uh, so well, you yeah. get that a we, lot, though. Yeah, 
We'll yeah. jump into the episode for sure. But uh, last week we had Lauren Lapkus on as our guest and it was so much, fun. Was so much fun having her. Um, and we asked for you guys to write us and tell us about if there was a Feeny character in your life. And we got a bunch of emails and yes. I have selected two of them to share with you guys here. Are you interested yes. in hearing them? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. OK, so this is from Jason Burke, and he said, you asked us to talk about what Mr. Feeney means to us, and I'm going to try to keep it brief. For me, Mr. Feeney was the first character that made me look for the lesson behind the lesson. He mm. broke the mold of the teacher stereotype. He taught the lessons already knowing that they would have subtleties and subtext that the students would need to use outside of the classroom. He stepped in with heart and care while never crossing the line of propriety and professionalism. Mr. Feeney taught your characters lessons while making us, the viewers, dig for the connections ourselves. He was a guy that no matter what the age gap was, every kid at home was rooting for him. That's a huge credit, not only to the writing staff, but the incomparable Bill Daniels and his acting ability. Thank you, Mr. Feeney, for helping us to figure out the kind of adults that we wanted to grow into. Lose one teacher, lose all teachers, lose yourself. <laughs> wow. I love you all. Email dismissed. Wow. That's an amazing letter. What Isn't is that great? Letter? Awesome. That's really well put. Yeah. Really Thank well you put. so much, Jason, wow. for that message. Oh, that's great. And I'm going to read you one more. This is for from Jake Versteeg or Versteege. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. If I'm not, I'm sorry. It says, hey, Pod Meets World team, just wanted to send a quick note about how Mr. Feeney has shaped me as an educator. I'm the athletic director at the Performing Arts Center Director of Vocal Music in Canton, South Dakota. I was just a little young for Boy Meets World when it originally aired. However, in high school and college, I fell in love with the show when it played on the Disney Channel. I always admired Mr. Feeney for the way he formed close-knit, appropriate, and meaningful relationships with the main cast on Boy Meets World. However, it was his final sign off that changed how I viewed education in general. Dream, try, do good. I'm tearing up as I write this, full honesty. <laughs> if I do nothing else as a teacher except to help children do those three things, then I will consider my career as an educator an immense success. I wouldn't be the teacher I am if the Mr. Feeney didn't exist as a character, and likely if William Daniels didn't brilliantly portray the role. Thank you so much for the opportunity to relive this show through the podcast. Love and admiration from South Dakota. Wow. Man. Aren't those great? Amazing. Yeah. And well, we and had I think so many a, of them. I think this is a good episode to talk about, you know, this is the, like one of the best Feeney episodes, too. Yes, <laughs> In terms is. of the sort of all-knowing teacher who uh sets up a situation and then has an amazing lesson uh yeah i i, I was i was blown away by this episode it we'll is it's a, it. it's a perfect episode let's jump in this is pod meets world i'm danielle fischel i'm Ryder strong and i'm will Fordell. So today we are covering season one, episode eight, Teacher's Bet. It originally aired November 19th, 1993. And um, the synopsis is that Feeney makes a bet with Corey to teach his class for one week. If more students pass the test, then Corey wins. And if more students fail, Feeney wins. So it was directed by David Trainer. It was written by April Kelly. And um, online, it also says that Jeff Minnell was an executive story editor for this episode. Oh, okay. Interesting. I don't even know what that means. I don't know I mean, what it means either, but it means I... Obviously, he was the executive story editor. Oh, Learn titles, writer. Right. Learn titles. <laughs> I have a it's feeling... It's kind of strange. And I this think. is just, you know, conjecture. I don't know. But I have a feeling it means someone wrote the bulk of the episode and then there was one person assigned to it because it, it was written by April Kelly, who also was an executive producer. So it's possible mm, right. she had so many other things going on in the week that that episode then got handed over to Jeff to make... To like rewrite. Exactly. To, yeah. Whether it's a punch up or it's yeah. a, or it's making the changes and he becomes then the executive story editor. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the original episode was created by April Kelly. Well, you know, what's interesting is that it will all depend on whatever the WGA, which is the Writers yes. Guild, um, rules are at the time right. and they change. So, I mean, you, you can see some things where it'll say like written by and it'll have one name and then it'll say story by and it'll have another name. And it's one of those things where somebody can come in and, you know, have have a great story and write the first draft 
And then it changes so much and changes so much that by the end, it's technically the teleplay or, or screenplay is written by somebody else. But the story credit is still given to the original person who came up with the idea. So there's all these tiny little rules that change all the time of how much you put in, what you did, how much work, how much time it's taken, which yeah. can change the different credits that you'll see on the on a television show. Well, and movie. television is a real mess, too. Because yeah, it's a quagmire. In, film, it's a quagmire. in film, it's much more sort of... Uh, structured and the rules are you know they literally count the words that between drafts and uh, assign credit based on that you know if you end up going to arbitration but in television it's such a team effort uh, that who ends up getting the credit sometimes is pretty arbitrary and there's also this weird tradition that has r risen in order to pay writers better they give them producer credits. Right. Yes. Um, so every writer right. basically is now no longer just trying to get their credit on a script and have a written by credit, or they're trying to get producer credit or executive producer yeah. credit or co-producer credit or associate producer executive credit. story editor Executives, or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, 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 because there's no producer's guild, there's no producer's union in the same way that there is a writer's guild and a director's guild and an actor's, you know, there's all these unions, but there's no producer's union. So the producer title which is in some ways the most important and sought after is also the most fluid. Um, yeah. And so when somebody says that they're a producer, that could mean, it could mean so anything. Many yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> it was All like right, the so first lesson in Hollywood, right? Yeah. It's like, if somebody it's introduces true. themselves as a producer, it'd be like, okay, but what, what have you actually what you really done? Tell, <laughs> what, you what, is, what do you tell me? Explain your skill set, please. Yeah. Well, I'm a producer. So this episode has two guest stars. One, myself as Topanga. Topanga's oh. finally back. You're mm -hmm. not a guest star. I'm so, even, That's my even credit. when you're a guest star to That's me, it's my like, credit. Recurring... I watched this with my wife and I was like, yes, Danielle's back. And <laughs> yep. no. Sue was like, that wait was... a second. Isn't wasn't she on all of them? And then I was like, no, that's no. what everyone thinks. And no, it's Indy, to my Indy, Indy immediately was like, oh, she's back. She's yeah, back. <laughs> exactly. I was like, all right. It was like it, it was so funny, I think the center of the show had been established. Yep. Do you Agreed. know what I mean? Like Agreed. the second that Corey's alternative friends episode, like that's all Indy cared about. He's like, oh yeah, okay, now she's back. And it was like, he was comfortable again. Yep. It, Same. Oh, now I know what the show is and I know the classroom. I know the environment. It's so funny. Well, tell Indy, thank you. Yeah. And then the most important guest star of this week is Lindsay Price as yep. Linda. Man, so apparently uh, Eric has gotten rid of Heather. That did not go well. Well, of course, it was a new it was a new week. So they need you know, that's how it was in the beginning. It was like, first we talk about Heather, then we see Heather. And now we need another guest star. So now Eric is apparently just with somebody else. And it's like, OK, all right. All right. We well, but obviously they also needed the ethnicity for this episode. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that was <laughs> that was I probably remember, the yeah. driving factor. The thing I remember most and we can get into it more when this when the scene comes, but about working with Lindsay was and again, I, I'm always, you know, I bash myself quite a bit on this on this po uh, podcast, which I will continue to do. But I distinctly remember working with her during the crying scene where she turned it on instantly. And I remember she's looking amazing. at her going, oh, my God, she's so much better than me. Oh, you're a real actor. Like, she's so good. She was she's amazing. so yeah. good. And it was like, oh, man, she's she's real. Like, I am not in this league at all. So, you I know, watched I did the episode and I remembered the exact same thing. Watching her cry. I remember the yeah. moments of watching that being filmed and being like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. different levels. She's of so greatness. Good. She's yeah. Different so level. Good. Yeah, it was like, man, she's good. Yeah. yeah. So I did, you know, I, I worked with Lindsay later. Um, I did a TV series with her. Um, called Pepper Dennis. It's a series that I met my wife on actually. Say, yeah. So yeah, we were all, we all, we all hung out a bunch then. And I remember like just kind of reintroducing myself to her and she was like, Oh yeah, I did that. I did your, I did a very special episode of your show. <laughs> and I was like, I think it was just an episode. I think <laughs> like everything about Boy Meets, you know, but people remember things as like very special episodes. I was like, yeah. oh, every episode of Boy Meets World had that vibe, right? Like yeah. uh, there was always this dramatic turn or this, you know, lesson. Um, but it was funny that in her mind, because I, you know, I don't think she watched the show beyond having done this episode in her mind, she remembered it as this, you know, like a big deal, a big, you know, and it, it, it is, of course. Well, but, it's actually um, one of the things Lauren Lapkus talked about last week yeah. is that the one of the things I think that made Boy Meets World special is that every episode did have that very special episode lesson, like you're talking mm -hmm. about, writer. But almost none of the episodes had that very special episode feel. They mm -hmm. didn't have that yeah. like changing of the music. Sometimes I think there are a few that that did, but you know, for the most part, it mm -hmm. was every week was a very special episode delivered in a very like 
we're just going to have a conversation about stuff that happens in real life. And you're not Mm going to feel like we're beating you over the head with a lesson. Mm -hmm. So, um, to her, like you said, it probably did feel very, very special. And to us, it was well, like, oh, obviously she had to cry too, you know, like, yeah. so yeah. her memory of it was yeah. like, I'm going on to this comedy show and right. I have to cry and have experienced racial attack. Right. Yeah. Like that yeah. is intense. That's not something you typically do as a teenage guest star on a, on a show. Um, yeah. I mean, I, the synopsis does not do a good explanation of saying that anything like that happens. It just explains the bet that happens with Corey, but right. um, you know, uh, I, I also remember, do you, maybe you guys can fill this in for me. I also remember it being more clear yep. from the Corey perspective, what, like that she had been called something racial. Oh, oh no. Yeah. So oh, we I remember it was, the it was in the script, right? Ben mispronounced it. Yes. yes. So it it down, the table like, okay. That's yep. how, okay. That we'll is just, how. We'll just call yep. it the G word. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, but yeah, the Asian word, slur. That the an Asian word. slur. From, yeah, that 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 was actually in the script. The only yeah. slur that's in the script is the the W word, mm-hmm. which yeah. uh, you know yeah. is interesting. But in the original script, because I remember we all at the table read Ben mispronounced it because right. we never heard it. He well, never, never heard it either. I had never I heard it. And everybody okay. laughed at the table read because you know, but it was such a sweet moment in retrospect that Ben did not know this yeah. word, yeah. and I didn't that, know it either. Like that to me shows the difference in ages. Just right there even the difference between being 12 13 years old and being 16 17 years old because mm-hmm. by this point i had seen like platoon and full metal jacket and and, oh, right. and all the vietnam that, movies that, that use that vietnam <laughs> movies that use this word over and over again so i was familiar with the word obviously and and i do i remember that same thing where it was but like, so yeah, why ben was it had- cut i mean was it cut because it was too offensive like i wonder if it was a Maybe. network note i um, don't remember i i wondered if it was cut just on disney plus no, I heard I, I distinctly remember him him mispronouncing the word and then it just not being there. Right. It was gone. Oh, it was after gone. The table it was read. got yeah. after the table read, huh? Yeah. I oh, bet, wow. okay, that was it. Yeah. That I was bet it. you it was a network note, right? I mean, because that's what I, I kept as it was building up to it, I was like, this is interesting because I was watching it with Indy and I was like, okay, we're gonna have to get into what this word means, or you know, the, the if if because I assumed it was coming and then it didn't come and I was kind mm-hmm. of relieved. And then yeah. I was like Oh, right. Well, how is how does that work? And and how would that work nowadays, too? You know, like, because I think now we exist in a space where we we just don't use those words, even if we're using them within a context of criticism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was an interesting moment to be like, oh, we're still going to just throw out one racially derogatory term uh, at Sean Hunter. But that's at- the thing. Why is why was why is one OK? Right. But the other one is cut. Is is the question that I had? I was like, wait yeah. a second. He's why why is that one all right, but the other one isn't? That that I found very strange. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't, and I also then felt like something was missing in from the Corey perspective. Clarity about what actually happened. Yeah, about what actually happened because I, without the context of knowing about that, they're reading about Anne Frank and that and all of that. If you, if my brother or sister or whoever came home and said someone called me a bad name, I don't think my first thought would be that it would be racially oriented. I don't know what I would think it was, but it it wouldn't necessarily, it needed, I thought it actually missed the fact that it should have been more pointed about what it was. Yeah. Um, So we'll, we will get to that scene. I know, we we just jumped right into the movie. We just jumped right into that stuff. (laughs) Let's let's go to the end. Let's go right to the end. So (laughs) we are in the school cafeteria. Sean brings Corey a Barry Bonds article and they call him the $43 million man because that's how much he's getting to play baseball for six years. And um, that obviously, that still sounds like a lot of money. And yet in comparison to what baseball players make now, it is practically nothing. nothing. For example, Mike Trout, recently signed a deal for $426 million for 12 wow. years. So about 35 million a year yeah. per year. He's almost making what Barry Bonds was making for his entire yeah. contract. A measly 7 million a year. Come on. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. It, I was just laughing about that. I was like, wow, that's, that's practically nothing compared to now. And yet that sounds like <laughs> so much money. I know. Um, Minka says Mr. Feeney is one of the top guys in teaching, and he only makes about $40,000 a year. I love this beat. I love this whole conversation. I think it's so smart and such a great way to set up a disparity that I don't think kids realize, you know, like I really don't think that this comes up enough. It still doesn't come up enough, but I just, and I love how specific it is to be like, yeah, 40. And, you know, I still 
the teachers still don't make more than 50 grand a year. No. If that, right. Yeah. Like this is not this public is school teachers. Such, anyway. Yes. It's yeah. such, and I love Lee's love for Feeney and I respect know. for Feeney. It's so beautiful to see. And um, it's so earnest. Uh, it's such a sweet moment. It, my, it recurs throughout the episode. My yeah. head instantly when I saw that scene went to, okay, backstory for Lee Nor like Minkus did Minkus and Mr. Feeney have a conversation where Feeney tells him what he's paid. Has Minkus <laughs> done the research to oh, find out the what, yeah, that's yeah. what I think too. That's what I care. I was like, oh, see. so he obviously <laughs> went to the library, went to the, the, you know, the, the, the town, uh, uh records <laughs> office to find out it because he's not Google tax it. returns. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, think to find out. I think it's, it's actually probably realistically, I think it's probably conversation with his parents at the dinner yeah. table, yeah. Maybe you know, yeah. talking about things that are that are important and that are going on in the world. And, you know, teachers don't make nearly enough money. And they probably right. had that dialogue with him. And he has that information from his parents. Um, so I feel like this is peak Sean outfit. <laughs> this is this is <laughs> this great. is what I remember. Like if I think about Boy Meets World season one, this is the outfit I'm wearing. And right. uh, this scene was like, I was like, oh, there I am. Uh, some kind of denim hoodie, colorful print, yeah, print thing. My hair is like in the right, like Sean look. Yeah, I'm it's extra voluminous. I'm dealing with it. It's in my face. I, I watched the scene. I was like, this is what I remember. This is this yeah. is what I remember <laughs> feeling like and looking like. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, you you're acting as though it was a bad thing, but you are so cute. No, you're so cute. I know so you awkward. I know you don't feel that way, but no. you are. You're just so cute and your clothes are oversized and you've got the you know, the minute your hair falls in your face, you're getting it out with your signature hand swoop. And it's I love the the spin that Sean doesn't think Feeney is worth that much money. And Minka says that Feeney is grossly underpaid. Corey mm. says nothing about teaching sixth, sixth grade ever changes. And he calls Feeney predictable. And then he walks through exactly what's going to happen next, that Feeney's going to come in. He's going to take a sip of water from the fountain. He's going to wipe his mustache. He's going to walk by. He's going to say, good mm -hmm. morning, Mr. Matthews. I trust you've done the homework. And then they're going to have this little exchange. And sure enough, Feeney exactly. walks in and does exactly what he details. But it's then also cool. predicts what Ben is going to say. Which exactly. Is great. Yeah. So right. they're both just as predictable. Just as predictable. Yeah. Feeney says, gosh, you're so predictable. So then we are in Feeney's classroom and they are talking about prejudice this week in class. Corey says he's prejudiced against the food in the cafeteria. Hey. And I have no idea why Topanga also laughs. <laughs> Topanga laughs at that joke. And she likes Corey. I guess. I yeah. guess she, she likes Corey, yeah. but like the first time we ever met Topanga, she was campaigning for the librarian. Right. And I feel like she for sure would be involved in the cafeteria life and would probably roll her eyes at the idea that you're going to make fun of these of the food that these hardworking people are making in the cafeteria. That would be my backstory for Topanga. Well, I but think they needed to establish that Ben's a class clown, right? Because and that's what then disruptive because that's the so I bet you it was a note for all of us. Yes. Like, oh, when Ben says this line, you guys should all Everyone laugh. Laughs. To yeah. yeah, to indicate that he's yeah. like disrupting the class. So it'll lead to the conversation after after the, the That makes the sense. But they gone. didn't yeah. show Minkus, because I guarantee you Minkus didn't laugh. Right. And right. so all I could see was me, and it, it just felt like Hey, Darn. why is yeah. why do I have to be in this camera shot laughing? Other people should be laughing, but I don't think Topanga would laugh. But you're right. They do need to set up that it would be that he's now disrupting the class. And mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Feeney I'd calls. Like, yeah. I'd like to say before you say Feeney calls Corey up to the thing. I've had this exact conversation with a teacher of mine. This exact oh. will come up to the front after the class. Every you're, you're, you're disrupting throwing everything. out jokes every time <laughs> you're making it more difficult. Like as I was sitting there watching, I had this just flashback to seventh grade where I had this exact conversation with the teacher. So that was really weird for me. I was like, oh, man, I've, I've had that. I've had that same conversation. Was, <laughs> like I had a visceral feeling where I had had that exact conversation with the teacher before. So I actually well, did, too, but it was later. I guess it was in high school. I definitely had a teacher pull me aside. It was a great conversation because I had a great teacher who just pulled me aside and he was like, hey, can you help me out? Oh, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? Route. He's like, nice. he's like, you know, the, uh, the, the other kids really look up to you. And when you do this and you talk like that and it, it makes my job really hard, can you just, 
And I, wow. I remember feeling like so devastated, like, oh, I'm, he's like, why, why are you doing this? Are you trying to like, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you want from this? And I was like, I, I'm sorry. I, I, he's like, yeah, cause I'm trying to teach you. Like, what do we, what are we here to do? And it was just like a, Hey, peer to peer, can you help me out? And I, it changed. I was like, okay, I will do whatever it takes. What, were to- you, I, I don't see you disrupting class I with know. jokes. Were you, were you like the jokey guy? I wasn't jokey. I don't know what I, but I mean, I remember this conversation because I've actually thought about it as a parent, you know, like it's such a wonderful way to approach a kid who's being disruptive. I don't think I, I mean, I must've been, I must've been either making jokes or just not taking it seriously or whatever, but it was, it was, what was so great about it was this teacher who, you know, in retrospect was 24 years old, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, And he basically asked me to help, you know, he empowered me. He didn't, he didn't try and like get into a competition with me he was like hey you clearly have this power over the other kids with you know the social power can you help me can you use that instead of trying you know and it was just like person to person i'm trying to teach yeah. a class what are you trying to do and it totally worked i remember being yeah. like oh my god my entire world shifted yes i will help you i will you know it, it empowered me which was yeah. just such a great way to approach yeah. that situation that was not the way my teacher approached it right <laughs> it was not we are peers can you help me out it was like yeah. what the hell do you think you're doing i'm the yeah. teacher you're the student shut up and it was so like, okay, sorry. Feeny falls somewhere in between, I suppose. Yes, He's a I bit know. of an yes. imposing figure, but he exactly. is, you know, just says, he calls Corey up to his desk after class and he says he's making his job difficult by having a comment on everything. And Corey says, well, Feeney's job is easy and it's the same thing he has to teach every year. It's just different students. And Feeney says he's been underestimating Corey's job as a sixth grader and says that they should maybe trade jobs for the week. Corey has to teach the class this week and give an exam while Feeney will sit in the class like a student and that's gonna lead to wackiness total (laughs) wackiness will ensue but Corey is in he thinks he's got the easy end of this deal so we're in the matthews living room eric comes home with linda a new girl and you you called her wheeze again which i yeah i still think is very cute i can't believe we ever dropped it yeah Uh, yeah they were and they were really you know still kind of eric and eric and morgan had kind of a relationship going on it was like you know bro- older brother younger sister kind of thing it was great yeah. and then one day it was just like yeah we're not doing that anymore. yeah i'm curious when this drops off because i didn't realize it lasted this long i mean it's yeah we're it's, this is this is your recurring thing is yeah. you and lily having these yeah. beats i have two yeah. recurring things it's the lily thing uh, three the lily thing different girlfriends and the jean on jean outfit <laughs> um are the three things that they just try to keep working do you uh, think do you guys think wheeze had anything to do with Polly Shore. Oh right, Polly Shore was big was, back then. Would Polly would, would that have Shore, been around the same time? Yeah. What did, did he? he what, say what did he said? Weasel. He called people weasels. What, what yeah. did he do? He did. Yeah. Maybe. We had enough Beavis and Butthead references. Exactly. That they were That's obviously... what we were thinking. This is the Beavis and Butthead of the house. Like this yeah. is the this is they're the house like, joke. They're pulling d- different pop culture references all the time. So maybe. Yeah, that's know. so funny. I wonder. Were you a, you weren't a, a Polly Shore fan? Well. I, I can't. I, I, didn't I mean, not that, not that him, I know. I'm just saying, no. like, back at the time, because I know that, for no. example, like, we we have a uh, Cartman, we have a Cartman reference in the, and yeah. then there was Sean episode because you were a big, um, why can't I think of the name of the show? South Park. <laughs> South Park. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So I was and wondering we also if maybe had a this was reference. Yeah. No, there was no, but no, I know it wasn't Towley. It was the little, it was the poop, whoever the poop was. The <laughs> right. Yeah. Poop with yep. the Heidi Ho. <laughs> but no, I, I was not a Pauly Shore fan. Okay. So this didn't come from you. Okay. So no, wow. no, 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 no. Hmm, But I wonder if that was somewhere in there. If that was like, there was like, a I was Pauly not, Shore this was season, but this was episode seven or eight. I was not hoping not even to talk to the producers, let alone give them like, what if we tried this? <laughs> like, no, I was <laughs> True. Well, That's something you waited till season four or five for. Exactly. Okay. So uh, Amy tries to get Morgan out of the living room, but she wants to stay and talk to Linda. And Morgan tells Linda, Eric has had billions of girlfriends. She was, she was funny in this episode. Yeah, she was. She's very cute. Um, Linda says that they're not, she's not a new girlfriend. Uh, Eric just wants to study with her and Morgan taps her on the hand and says, Oh, please, you're going to fall for that one. Um, Then they all go into the kitchen to get a snack while Corey and Alan rush into the living room. Corin, Corey tells his parents about him being a social studies teacher for the rest of the week. And Corey compares Mr. Feeney's job to being Vanna White. (laughs) <laughs> Alan is not so sure about any of this and he wants to know what what are you what are the stakes of this bet and it is revealed that Corey has given up his bike if Mr. Feeney wins and this is a funny unrunning joke to me 
Yeah. With Rusty just convinced that Mr. Feeney actually just wants the wants bike. The bike. Just wants the bike. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty, it's like, why does he want that bike? Why does like, he want the was, bike? That was funny. I know. And she goes, of course, you know, this is just one of those Feeney lessons. And he goes, what if the lesson is, I want that bike. I want that yeah. bike. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny to have Amy say, you know, one of those Feeney lessons. Like, it's a thing. Yeah. It really established the idea that this is, this is going on for years. Which, you know, it's also funny to... I, this is maybe the first episode where they've referenced the fact that Corey has other teachers, you know, that right. there's not like there's right. five yeah, yeah. that it, it, because I think they finally had to acknowledge the fact that by sixth grade, you have different teachers for different subjects. So this was is this the first time we learn what subject Feeney teaches? Social studies? Yeah, I because think so. I don't think, I don't think we, it's I don't think we had a set, you know, no. and, he, and he makes a reference in that earlier episode to the, the that grade I gave you in math. Yeah, you know, so there's like what what Feeney is just all around teacher. Yes, yeah. uh, he teaches I, what needed to be taught that week. What needed to be taught. Yeah, and so of, I'm yeah. curious how that's going to evolve because it's it's established in this one that he is one of five teachers, or he teaches five different classes, and that he teaches social studies. And I wonder how consistent that's going to be. Yes, let, well, uh, we'll keep a let's consistency keep track. monitor. Well, on but that yeah, but let's, you know, if he's only been his teacher for this year, um, it's going to be interesting. You know, uh, but it's as, also, as I mean, let's be honest. When you were in so, the, your social studies, at least in my school, you're so, and I was went to public high school, everything public middle school. Your social studies teacher did not give you books to read. Mm -hmm. It did not give you literature. It's not no. like how you're in social studies. Now you're going to read the diary of Anne Frank like that right, never right. happened. Right. So that right. was a weird crossover where it's like, you know, I'm your social studies teacher here. Read this book. Like, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, at the end of this season, we also read Steinbeck. I think we do Grapes of Wrath reference. You, or something. Okay. Uh, yeah, because there's a union episode. I remember singing Look for oh, the Union, union label. label. And, none of, <laughs> and I think that's knew a, that song. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so I think that's a Steinbeck. Re so we're reading literature more than. Than yeah. anything, and yeah. uh, in in his social studies class, which is mm -hmm. weird. So, yeah, all right. well, kind of makes what for a you good need, episode. whatever lesson have lesson will travel. I think another <laughs> little continuity <laughs> error, perhaps. What? Yes, There's no. continuity. Not this show. Lily Lindsay. No. So we are back in Mr. Feeney's classroom and Feeney is sitting in Corey's seat. Minkus panics when he finds out Corey is teaching the class this week. And it is such a cute <laughs> yeah. reaction. What's, what's going on? Looking left and right and freaking out. Yes. So funny. Oh my God, he's so also, funny. when I saw myself sitting in the front seat, I, front, I had just a light bulb went off about how much I loved that dress, that green kind of peasant dress with like a little mm -hmm. bit of a puffy sleeve and an elastic around the wrist. I found out where the wardrobe stylist bought it. And then I asked for one they bought and I paid them back so that I could have one in my own closet. That's so cool. Nice. So I, I like love have it? that dress. I don't, I don't still have it, but I did love that dress. And I think, I think my cousin ended up buying it too. Like we all loved it. It was like such a, it was a very popular dress at the time. I, do you remember it. feeling that Topanga was weird or, like, or different than you? And and did you like that? Or do you, I'm curious because, I mean, it was obviously like a, I, we've talked about when you did your first episode, it was it was a it was a real difference from you. Right. Yeah. Like you had to talk differently. You had to yeah. say all these weird things. And in this episode, you get to do like, you know, get even more out there with the yoga stuff. Yeah. So I'm curious, how do you do you remember like judging Topanga or thinking Topanga was cool? I thought good. I thought Topanga was cool. I oh, cool. I also thought you know channeling and making that weird sound I make for what so I was going to respond to. That was like, a great sound. That of course to twelve year old Danielle was like, well, that's weird. But yeah. <laughs> but all of the other stuff about Topanga, certainly her confidence, her yeah. um, you know, I remember thinking it was cool. Even the line she had about where where he said, "You're going to be one of those girls who doesn't shave her legs," and her saying, "Well, I haven't decided yet." I yeah. remember thinking that's cool that she ha knows that there's a decision coming up and she's aware that she's going to have to choose something. And she's even comfortable just saying, I haven't decided yet. Cause yeah. I think young Danielle really felt like um, I needed to be decisive about everything. And, and like, if you took time to really think about, th think things through too much, mm -hmm. it showed it almost made you weak, which makes no sense. But I think that's how I thought. So anytime I had like a choice to make, I was always very sure of my choice and then jumped right into it without necessarily right. giving it a lot of thought. Right. And I think what I thought was cool most about Topanga was the thing that was hardest for me to do, which was just that she was slow. She slowed down and she didn't feel that she had to be on anybody else's time constraints. And yeah. uh, I, I recognized that in her and admired it. 
That's so well, cool. Ben also talks so fast that it is such a contrast when you, you sometimes when you're an actor, you you play to the person you're with. So when you are sitting there and the person you're with is speaking that quickly and you know that you're like, I've got to take my time with yeah. everything. It's man that can I can see how that can mess with you. It's like, no, nope, mm -hmm. slow down, slow down, slow down. Yeah. Can I yeah. ask, and this might just have been me and I might just be overly sensitive or weird now that I'm getting older, but I found it a little strange, the, the whole nudity exchange between two 12 year olds. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Again, I might be over, but the kind of you're not going to come naked, are you? And it's like, well, I have no problem with nudity, which I get. I like the, the body positivity. But at the same time, I was kind of like, a little weird. I don't know. No, I thought it was funny. Yeah, right. it didn't bump me only because me. I could totally I could totally see I can see for sure why a why a Corey character, why any 12 year old kid when talking about a dress code would absolutely go. You're not going to come like without clothes on, are right, you? Like, that's, right. And then her response of, well, no, although there's nothing wrong, nothing with, wrong with that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. almost like she can't let any, she couldn't just say, no, I'm not. She also had to say, but if I were going to, there would be nothing wrong with it. Right. She like has to also get her little lesson in, yeah. um, which I also think is something a, a kid would like not be able to not express their opinion if they had one. Um, so no, it didn't, it didn't okay. help me. And I think I get I think I get bumped by those things like you do, Will, as I get Well, I think in the society that we're living in right now, everybody's very overly sensitive about everything. And so you're mm -hmm. kind of double checking everything that was said and should it have been said and how it was said. And I think that I'm trying not to watch the show through those overly sensitive eyes. So there's times where I will in my head be like, that didn't sit right. And then I'm like, I, I think that's just me. Like you're just yeah. reading into something because you're looking for something to kind of like be offended by, which is a, a new thing in, the, in our country. So um, <laughs> Will's yeah. like, should I be offended? Am I offended? Yes. Am I offended? Am I offended? By this? Do I get to press the offensive button right now? And it's like, okay, I don't. I want to make sure that I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm specifically not doing that. Well, and I, I, I yeah. So. I had a very similar thing when. So Corey writes, he comes into the class. He writes that his name is Hey Dude on the chalkboard, saying that that's his name. He tells everyone they can wear hats in class. They discard the dress code. Topanga wants to discard the dress code because she wants to wear garments from cultures more in tune with the goddess. And the minute I said that, I remembered, oh, yeah. I'm going to show up in a sorry. <laughs> like yeah. I, I remember yeah. that that happened. And it, I had the same feelings of, is this cultural appropriation? Is this something Topanga should not have been doing? And I was thinking about one of, you know, cultural appropriation and what it really means. And it's, you know, it's ultimately adopting elements from other cultures without acknowledging that they are from other cultures and, and not, and kind of disregarding them or treating them like fashion statements. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I came to it, and it's not even in the scene, it's in the next classroom scene. But one of the things I thought of is that this is really about Topanga respecting, it's a, it's a yoga culture thing for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, yoga did originate in India. And so she is wearing a traditional Indian attire and she is certainly respectful of it. I'm not sure that the channeling has anything to do with yoga. I'm not sure what yeah, that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> But, yeah, have Topanga make a funny sound. That's, yeah, that's what exactly. That, was. that yeah. is exactly what that note was. But I also <laughs> will had the exact same feeling when it came to Topanga wearing the sari. Was like, am I doing some? Was Topanga doing something wrong here? Yeah. Is that something that yeah. she should not have been doing? Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that in just a second. Corey gives the same homework assignment Feeney gave the night before. Minka says they already did that. And Corey tells Minkus to get a life. And again, they treat him pretty harshly at times. Well, you know, this is funny. Um, uh, Indy did not want to be recorded for this episode. He wanted oh. to take an episode off. So we, okay. we don't have a too much shirts, but we watched it together. I said, He's you under know, contract, you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely wanted to give him permission to like, you know, do the show or not based of on course. how he feels. And I was like, yeah, okay, well let's just watch it together. But he, this was the first time because I've, you know, in, in previous episodes, I've talked about how, like, I'm kind of mean to Minkus, don't you think? And he has not really acknowledged that until this episode. When I told in this scene, when I told Minkus to shut up and that's just mm. like the entire line, uh, 
Indy, Indy was like, you're mean. I was like, yeah, dude, that's what I've been saying. Right. Don't you remember? I threw things at his head. What, what yeah. Did he, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I felt overly harsh in this episode. Um, I agree. But finally, finally, Indy acknowledged that my character was being kind of mean. Well, and you know what's interesting about it is that this episode started with the three of you, Minkus, Corey, and Sean in the cafeteria. And the first thing Jensen and I thought when we watched it was, wow, Look at Minkus just being a friend. Being yeah, they're hanging out. Yeah, yeah, the three of you guys are friends. And so it is interesting that then it's it seems like depending on where you are, you know, if Minkus mm-hmm. is out of the classroom, uh, he's more of your friend. Right. When he's in the classroom, you guys are very mean to him. And it does feel like maybe it's a it's a competition thing about quote unquote intelligence or yeah. or studiousness. He's always mm-hmm. getting answers or class. right. Exa- yeah. And class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's getting answers right. He's paying attention. He's doing the homework. He's pointing out that you guys are not and you guys are constantly telling him to shut up because he's making you look bad and yep. or you think he's a nerd for caring. Yep. And he yep. is telling you that you guys are going to grow up to be losers because you're not yep. caring. So right. it is interesting that outside of the classroom setting, you guys seem to actually get along pretty well. But sure. inside but just the also- classroom. It could be, and I doubt it's this. If it is, it's genius. If it is, then they were writing on a whole level that we never saw before. And I doubt it's this. Be prepared um, to be told that that is what it is. Whatever exactly, you're of about course. to say. Of course, that's what it was. It was awesome <laughs> writing. But we all grew up and had friends that treated us one way when we were together and a completely another way when we were around other people. Yeah. Hmm. Everybody had those kind of friends where it was like, why are you so cool to me when it's just the two of us or the three of us together? But when there's five of us together, I'm the jerk and I'm the butt of every joke and blah, blah, blah. And we like that was a very common thing. I know I dealt with that all the time. I had two friends that were the coolest guys in the world when it was just the three of us. But when there was another person there or more other people there, I was getting bullied. I was being made fun of like it was bad. Uh And that seems to be kind of a reoccurring thing with younger people. You always seem to find that or hear about that where it's like, why am I your friend when it's just the two of us? But when there's a third person here, I'm a jerk. And it almost there's part of me that was like, wow, if they were writing on that level, that's I think it's impressive. more what I said. I think it yeah. probably, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> but, I think, but it is. But you're it's right. Like, that is a thing that kids do. And so yeah, whether or not it was absolutely. intention, whether or not it was intentional, it makes sense. It, right. it is something that right. we've all experienced probably. My guess is it wasn't intentional, but if it was, you know, if you're right. Was. The writers would be like, of course it was intentional. Of course, of course that it from was. You'll get emails right. from, from our writers. <laughs> exactly. I was definitely thinking that. That was the point. Well, I mean, I do think that, you know, in general, our show, while it is poking fun at, the Topangas and the Minkuses, it's still including them. They yeah. are still yeah. central to the show. And strong. And, and strong. And and so the show is actually inviting, e- even while it's pointing out, like, these people are weird, the show overall is inviting you to consider them and to include them. And, and so, to hear their POV. And to hear yeah. their POV in a way that I definitely think other shows would would not do that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I think that there are other shows that would take the easier joke. In the same way we talked about with the Feeny character, you know, uh, so ultimately Boy Meets World is an inclusive, respectful show. Yeah. And that's, so there, that's there is something to that, right? Like, so it sets up the nerd, non, you know, dynamic or whatever, or weird girl, we out there, new agey girl, a dynamic, and it plays it for the jokes. But ultimately they are Indy's favorite characters. Yeah. yeah, that's what he he wants them to be a, a part of the the show. He that's what he's looking forward to that that clash and that conversation. So, ultimately, I think the show is is pretty inclusive. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think most of the people, especially when you're growing up, most kids aren't Corey. Yeah. Most kids aren't the cool kid that has the awesome family that is you know friends with everybody. Most kids right. are some are like Minkus or they're like. Topanga, or I mean, they're different and they're trying to find their way. And so there's always somebody to kind of gravitate towards. That's why mm-hmm. when I love when you read those letters at the beginning, Danielle, where there were kids that were watching the show that gravitated towards Feeny. Yeah. Like yeah. the older teacher was the character that they loved the most. It's that's yep. that's rare in TV when you get kids liking the 65 year old teacher the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, that is a credit to the writing and, and the acting, of course. So we're back in the Matthews kitchen. Eric brings Morgan a Japanese lantern from Linda, and Morgan is so excited about it. Eric says he can't talk because he has to call Linda, even though he just left her house. Corey comes home and says class was a total success. Alan asks how he taught the class, and Corey says he just skimmed the book. And Alan starts questioning the test and the grading system. Again, he's very worried about this bike that's on the line. And um, he ends up, you know, explaining to Corey that, 
the way the test is going to be graded, it's going to be graded on a curve. And yeah. Mr. Feeney, who wrote the test, is going to take the test, which means he's going to get 100% and everybody is going to be graded against that. And suddenly Corey becomes a little more panicked. Yeah. This was an act break that Indy did not understand. Yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> was, I, I just huh? had to say, uh, Feeney's going to win the bet. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to explain. He's like, what does that mean? Curve? It was it is, Yeah, okay. I know. Just, also, just know, I all you need to know is look at Ben's face. That's yeah. enough of an act break. Right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know yeah. if teachers really grade on a curve in, in junior high or high school. Do yeah. they? Is that a thing? I, I think. I don't is know. it? Maybe. I don't know. I we don't know. No idea. Um, okay, so we're back in Mr. Feeney's classroom. And... The the clothes in this scene, this is where I'm talking about. I did have that question of, oh, no, what is she wearing? And then going through with whether or not I thought it was cultural appropriation uh, or would we consider that today? And I don't really know. Um, I feel like uh, it's Topanga embracing and, and loving a culture. And like I said, it, it being part of yoga culture more so than her trying to adopt traditional Indian culture, but I don't know. I'm obviously, I'm not the person it offends. So I'm not the person who should say whether or not it is offensive. But mm. um, I remember that I thought the outfit was beautiful and I enjoyed being in it. Um, and then in my later years, like I did end up becoming super into yoga. I was like quite, <laughs> quite a yoga person, which is not Were something you really? young. Oh yeah. Big time. Yeah. I, I did. I even taught yoga for a very short amount of time. Did you really? Yeah. In um, between your gift wrapping. I was going to say wrapping gifts <laughs> teaching yoga. It's amazing. Well, I didn't have like, I don't have my yoga license or whatever. I basically went to this kind of, I guess you can call it an untraditional yoga school because the teacher went out of town and he was going to be gone for like a week. And he just was going to close this, close the class. It was, he was the only person who taught and he was just going to close the class down for a week. And I was like, oh man, that's such a bummer. Cause I was going every single day, sometimes twice a day at this time. And he said, well, I mean, if you're interested, do you want to, do you want to just run the class while I'm gone. And I was like, sure. So I basically got to teach yoga a few times wow. without any formal training. I basically just taught the the class that I had remembered him teaching. So anyway, yeah. It was, and there are people with back problems there, to this day. Exactly. And there are people, <laughs> I, exactly, and there are people who are going to write poor me letters. people who are like, why is Topanga teaching our why yoga class? Why is she class? doing this? Why is she, she having us do shoulder stands day one? Today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If I harmed you and during wow. a yoga class, yeah. please contact yeah. us. Yoga is uh, a very <laughs> interesting way of hiding doing about like 60 push-ups. That's all that yoga is to me. <laughs> yeah. like, just tell me to do a push-up. Well, That's I wonder true. how, I mean, in yoga's pretty mainstream now, or at least in California, yeah. I don't know, yoga, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, back then in the 90s, it still must have seemed like a pretty unusual You're right. You're right. Practice. 93 yeah. For, in America. To, to, be, yeah. to be talking about yoga was not as common as it is now. No. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Corey says he needs Sean's help with the class. Topanga moves her desk and she sits on a yoga cushion. Minkus is bouncing on a, I, that's technically like a yoga ball, I think. Right. You know, it's exercise like a yoga ball. It's like an exercise well, it's, ball. No, it's a, it's a, that's a, it's a, a toy when you're growing up. It's called a, a Mr. Bouncy, a bouncy ball. That, that's oh, really? Like, you would oh, race really? other kids that are oh. on that. So oh, I thought it was one that. of those, like, because people use those at their desks these days, yes, right? Like, that's that's what what way to the handle makes it the toy. So gotcha. those oh. are just regular, regular sitting balls. But when you have the handle, it's called like a bouncy ball or Mr. Bounce Lot. <laughs> Jensen, uh, producer Jensen, if you could look it up, because that you would race, you'd each be on one and it'd be like a line of kids like racing on the, oh. on the balls. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 I did not know that. That uh, is a very so 70s, amount 70s, 70s of, toy. of uh, paper airplanes and paper balls being thrown. <laughs> oh, man. Like, it, it does like, get What do these kids do it? Just... Just, can just I, throw it across I, the room. We, we need to illustrate chaos. Chaos yeah, in the I bring up one thing that I find very funny, and of course this is how it has to be because Corey is the star of the show, but this is now the second or third episode where <laughs> to teach Corey a lesson, Feeney will the allow entire. the other kids to <laughs> not learn anything. Yeah, You know, where it's like, <laughs> right. you're going to not learn anything and fail this week because we need Ben to learn a lesson. <laughs> Well, even in the opening scene, when Ben predicts what Feeney's going to do, he only talks to Mr. That's Matthews. Like, <laughs> it's like, well, what's up with Mr. Hunter and Mr. Minkus sitting right there with it. him? Again, though, this show is from Corey's POV. I know, I know, so I know, it probably I just feels that way. I know, like, yes. But I thought that was so funny. You're all going to learn nothing this week because we need to teach Corey a lesson. Well, like, and, oh, or, or that Feeney is so all-knowing that he knows that in the end, it's still going to work out and everyone will learn a lesson. Learn Okay. Yeah. Even you know he doesn't know how, but he knows ah. that it that it will happen. So, 
Everyone's throwing the paper airplanes. Corey is go- glowing, going through attendance. I am not sure why he starts with attendance at Lawrence Topanga, but that must right be the, the first, the first <laughs> name on the list <laughs> is Topanga Lawrence. Nice. Of course. And uh, she says that she is channeling and, Gives and that. that she only answers to. <laughs> That's a great I, sound. I loved that um, what I could hear, first of all, the scene had to have been pre-taped. It wasn't probably done in front of the live studio audience because as Ryder mentioned, we needed to show chaos in the classroom. And mm-hmm. so with the bouncy ball and the moving of the desk and the yoga cushion and the plane, there were probably going to be a lot of parts. resets and moving yeah. parts that we wouldn't have taken the time to do this in front of the live studio audience. And when I do the channeling sound that I will answer to, you can hear the laughter that isn't canned audience laughter. It's the it's actual, actually producers, the producers yeah. and yeah. writers. Yes. And it was it was a big laugh. And I don't remember the process of getting there or if this was the first time I did it. And that's what I, you know, I don't remember if it was something that like they kept having to ask me to do differently. And then we finally got here or if this was the first time I did it. And that's what came out. But Ben's I reaction remember- feels very real. Yeah. Like when it cuts to him and you can tell, tell he takes an extra beat, like yeah. he's sort of taken aback by what you've just done. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I yeah. think it was I think it was probably the first time you did it. And it some, may have been. Something might have might, must have been different. You know, they yeah. might have had a line there that was different and it was like oh try this exactly this was either an alt that yeah i think it was an alt alt. yeah it felt like an alt to me yeah yeah Yeah. me too because that joke can go a million ways right i only answer to and you insert funny name cleopatra right you could have said any there's a million ways for that joke to work but for you to just do this weird growl cat thing it's just great it was great it was it was really fun um and then feeney shows up and he's wearing a full phillies outfit so he's wearing his full phillies outfit he sits down to play cards with sean he says hey dude Mm -hmm. and i loved writer watching you interact with bill this way yeah it was great <laughs> so fun I, I remember doing this i remembered the line like the second this episode started i was like oh i have a line about roll aids i remember this <laughs> so i definitely remember like playing poker and you can tell i'm like really into playing the cards like later on when i'm laying out the cards uh, yeah it was fun so then we're back in the matthews living room Corey is reading a book for class he tells alan no one is listening to him and alan says he needs to be more authoritative eric then comes home with linda who is crying and obviously very upset morgan runs over to linda sees that she's crying asks what's wrong and eric says that a jerk at the mall called her a bad name now Corey is shocked that this happened at their own mall. And this is the moment for me where I thought it needed to be more clear. When he says at our mall, it needed to be more clear what the jerk called her because it would, it should not be surprising to anyone anywhere there, that there could be a jerk in public at the mall, like a, a jerk alone should not be shocking, but a racist jerk to a kid could definitely feel like because the point of that the point of him asking today and now is that he has already established that prejudice is something of the past right Right. he said that you know that what we learned about in history he says it to alan in that scene like prejudice when we used to have prejudice or whatever um and that's a really important point you know like i think that that's that is the way a lot of kids think about what they're learning in school and these kinds of issues, especially in the nineties. I feel like we all lived in a naive uh, time when it felt like racism was of the past. Right. These we've overcome all this. Thanks. Thanks to civil rights in the sixties. We've, we've solved all that problem. Right. Exactly. I do think that that was the prevailing mentality, um, uh, you know, for most of us. And, but so it's really important that, 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 that Corey, understand what was said by that jerk and it's you're right it's a missed opportunity um it's a missed opportunity for it to be a little bit more clear and you're probably right that it was a a network note that they didn't want to say the word um and yet he didn't say the word in this scene he said the word in the, in, in the classroom, classroom. In the classroom. that's right. what I remember. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, did. but you, but it could have been. I think it could have been clearer in this scene. There, there's a way to say, it, you know, yeah. some, you know, call it was a racist jerk, a you racist know, or just jerk. A, yeah. a jerk said something really awfully and racist. Um, um, yeah, leaving it ambiguous is a little tricky. I, I just want to add. Uh, did you notice that they come in from outside? 
in coats and talk about how chilly it was. Yes. Yeah. Which made me think about, remember how I talked, I, I said on that other episode, I was like, I don't remember ever referencing Philly and the weather, but we yeah. did. We clearly we did. did. I told you, and I told you, yeah. I know for sure because I can't yeah. act in a coat. Yeah. And so, and, and so I, I remember. I totally forgot all of it, but the second I saw it, I was like, oh, this is cool. A little reference to yeah. it. Okay. Like there I, being a city and a life. I forgot I hate, all of that. hate, hate to bring this up. Uh-oh. But I'm gonna. Uh-oh. Wouldn't it make sense that Amy and Morgan were playing in the backyard, and if they were, <laughs> they came in the back door. Where does she say they were? She doesn't, but I'm no. saying, who goes and plays in the side yard? I mean, she they come in that door with their jackets on like it's cold, so they're not coming from the driveway, which we've already established with Rue McClanahan. Why are they not it. coming through the driveway? What if they were at the grocery store or what if they had just been? At no, the no, mall? no. But what, no, what I'm saying is if you come from the driveway, we established with Rue McClanahan that if you came from the driveway because Feeney comes in and says, you just ran yeah. over my flowers in the driveway, you came in the kitchen door. Mm -hmm. So they weren't coming from the driveway unless they decided to bypass the door that's easy and walk all the way to the side of the house. Well, the front we've seen the front of the house on the the, the Studio City Colfax house. We've right. seen it. That is definitely the front door. Sure. The red sure. front door. The red front door. OK. And then they I don't know where the driveway is in that scenario, but I, I don't mean none, the then none of it makes sense. Everyone comes to that's no, the door everyone comes to to knock on the door. That Hello. is the front okay. door. Well, obviously. You are team side yard. I am I am team. It doesn't make any sense yard <laughs> and that both are kind of like they just keep switching. So it's like, but will nothing yeah, make any sense? The continuity here is I not our strong suit. I can't let this go, Danielle. We've already established that. I am firmly team backyard. I also think in the script it said backyard. So you where know. do you think they're coming from then? I'm curious. When they walk in the back and say it's cold, where in your mind are at what were Amy and, and Morgan doing? And coming? they've come in the front door, right? That's where they come in with their no, coats they on. Come no, in, they, they come, they come in, the, in from the oh, that, upstage door upstage in the middle, door. upstage yes, French doors. That's what I'm asking. Where it's, do those go? Uh, wherever the director needed them to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. in order to keep, <laughs> know, you know, because they can't have walked in the same door that you and Lindsay walk in because that right. would mean that they were like. 30 right behind seconds you. behind yeah. you right so oh let's give them another entrance oh and by the way we'll put them let's in coats instead of coming from the kitchen let's I'm use just these curious. doors i'm just yeah. gonna keep bringing this up because i oh, it makes gosh. no sense it makes please no let sense. us know if you're team side yard or team backyard we yeah really i'm gonna i'm gathering enough people for the teams okay. we're gonna have to So as I said, Eric has says that there said that there was a jerk at the mall who called her a bad name, and Corey is shocked that there happened that this happened in their own mall. Will do you rem like what do you remember about this scene and Lindsay needing to cry, and what was that process like? I remember sitting there as a young actor and realizing we talked about this at the beginning just how on a different level as an actor she was than I was. I wasn't comparing to anybody else, just me. And it was like we were playing two completely different games. Uh, so we're sitting out there and, you know, you're there's an audience there by this point. You you know, you're into the show. There's stuff going on. You're not in the back, uh, you know, sitting in your trailer, your dressing room, preparing for a scene. You're just in the moment. You're doing what you had to do. And she could turn it on so fast that we would sit there and we were waiting for our cue. She would turn and walk away from me. She'd come back. She'd walk away. She'd come back. By the second or third time, she was bawling. Mm -hmm. I mean, tears dripping down her face, bawling. And so in the moment that you wanted to go and put your arms around her like, oh, my God, are you OK? What can I do to help? It was such a lesson for me in acting that it was I will never forget that moment of just watching something that was so visceral and so pure and she got there so fast wonder, that it was amazing to me was she i wonder what it was like during the week when you guys were rehearsing i can't was remember she i want to say she cried during the run-throughs too especially the network run because wow, she could so just cool. turn it on <laughs> yeah and so it was it's such a cool skill my, my wife yeah. can do oh. that she's always been that an fast like that oh, fast yeah. oh, oh yeah man. it's 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 a it's a running joke in our house that if she has an audition where she has to cry she's gonna get the part because she <laughs> nails it. It's insane. Ugh. And it was funny when we first started dating, 
because she cries in life that easily too. Like okay. if any any conflict, any emotion happens, the tears, the snot, it's like all there. It's just immediately. And I remember when we first started dating, you know, because in, in previous relationships, when somebody cries, it's like, oh, 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 there's something wrong here. We right. need to like, yeah. let's let's take a moment. You're having an emotional reaction that's taking it to a new level. And with Alex, I had to be like, oh, no, no, that's just every day. Like you yeah. just <laughs> cry. You just and it's always on. Like She's always just on the verge of tears. You know, like it's yeah. right there and it's an amazing um, tool as an actor. Yeah. If you can have, if you can do that, if you can really produce <laughs> the liquid and be that quick, it's, a, it's incredible. And yeah, I mean, obviously Lindsay has that skill because you see it in the scene. It's, it feels real. It, it it's suddenly yeah. has an, an edge to the scene that doesn't. Yeah feel typical for a sitcom it's it's well, not fake tears it is no, somebody it's actually emotion having was yeah. there and she yeah. got there instantaneously it was yeah. not i remember when i uh one of the first jobs i ever had was a really bad cop show that we shot in new york city called true blue and it was just bad <laughs> but uh, the episode that i did um I, you know, the, random happenstance, whatever happens, but then I had to cry and I could kind of do it, but it wasn't great. It didn't look good. So they literally had this menthol thing Oh yeah, that oh, they yeah. would blow into your eyes mm -hmm. and that would make you tear up and cry. Yeah. And the second time she did it, a little piece of the menthol inside broke off and shot into my eye. Oh, wow. And it was one of those things where it was then like having to flush my eye out and do all this stuff. But it was, I remember just thinking right as she made herself cry, like, like, man, they don't have to blow anything in their eyes. <laughs> it was it was such a lesson for me and just how I was not to that level yet or maybe ever. It's, to a, that it's just... a separate skill for sure. I, wow. think it's a, I think it's a unique skill. And I also don't think there's any shame in actors using menthol. I agree. Or, sure. sure. I think no, it's I agree. totally fair game because I I would rather like what I can't stand is watching actors try and produce tears when they can't. Right. And, and they're pretend doing there that are tears stare. there when there are. They're doing yeah, that yeah. stare acting. Or the blink, you know, like, the uh, blink acting where it's like oh, you're trying to get that one tear to Tom pop Tom Cruise out. trying to cry in every movie where Tom Cruise has to cry. It's like the worst thing to have to watch. It's like, dude, just, I don't care. Like, blow whatever, put yeah. whatever you need to. Let's cut, you know, yeah. give you yourself You know they're tears. doing some of them digital Ugh. now. They're literally digitally oh, putting digitally, in tears. Digital at tears. Right. Wow. Digital well, there's tears also that acting that. thing. I, I love the like the single tear, you know, like yeah. just the one down the cheek when an I actor I mean, that's can what do I that. had to do in the Jack Ugh. Harlow music video, guys. That's what I had to do for that. Really? Did you awesome. cry? Did you cry? Cry? I did. did I really no, I really no, no, I really cried. But uh, um, I've I've always been able to cry, but it used to be a lot harder for me to get there. Now that I have children, I can make myself cry <laughs> over anything. Just a single thought about a child or somebody else's child. Yep. Anything that pertains to my emotions, I am a raw nerve wow, after having awesome. children. And I, I just need to see the Sarah McLaughlin video with the dogs. And I'm oh, fine. yeah, just <laughs> even picture that and it's, and it's over. So Corey shows up to the classroom and he's dressed in his amazing suit, the green suit that I love from the geography tournament. He asks for Minkus's help, but Minkus says, why should he help? You know, Corey, you're always making fun of Mr. Feeney. You're on your own. And Corey then walks up to the front of the class. But before I get to what he says in the front of the class, can we discuss? I know what's going on. Oh. Meatloaf. Meatloaf? What is double that meatloaf. all about? Guys, double meatloaf. Du <laughs> double meatloaf. <laughs> meatloaf times two. Meatloaf hat. Meatloaf sweatshirt, meat feeny. What is happening? I don't understand the reference because I don't also either. this is before Bad Out of Hell too, right? Like, because yes. I'm trying to think like when Meatloaf had his moment in the '90s, but that was after this. Yeah. That was like '90s. Bad Out of Hell 95. one was like the late '70s. Also, right. So are why we trying to the... say that Feeny thinks that Corey or uh, some that any of the kids are Meatloaf fans? Is that what he thinks? Like the kids were into? I. I those oh, no. hip kids and their meatloaf music. Guys, I'll never understand it. We will post a picture of Bill in this oh, meatloaf, yeah. double meatloaf hat and sweatshirt. <laughs> Yeah, so I, our producer Jensen sent me a photo that he took too, while you yeah. guys were watching it, and I thought it was photoshopped. We did. I, too. Thought, I thought it was this because yeah. I remembered him wearing a yeah. Phillies outfit, and it looks like a Phillies outfit. I was like, "Oh, somebody photoshopped Meatloaf into onto Mr. Feeney," and it was like, "No, no, no, that's, that's actually yeah. what he wears." Yeah, it's he took crazy. a picture from our TV screen. It doesn't and, make any sense. And what Jensen was, was laughing so hard, and he goes. 
he goes, to be clear, both of your co-stars thought it was Photoshopped. Yes. I was like, I mean, how could we <laughs> not remember this? So I what will... is it? What is, I mean, was Meatloaf popular or did, did we get Meatloaf clearance? Was That's what I'm wondering. That, it's like, like the one band that was like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Use, you can use Meatloaf. Like, no, you can't use anything else. Just go use Meatloaf. Like you can't use Nirvana or it's 93. So it's is like it just because is it's kind and... of funny? Like, you know, just but the name who? Meatloaf? The 12 year olds watching know. the show are like, man, oh, great. Meat, nailed that Meatloaf joke. <laughs> I don't know, guys, but I I only want to call him Meat Feeny from now on. I I love it. So funny. I I also love. I also love going back to what you said about Minkus very quickly. I love that he wouldn't help Corey, not because Corey always made fun of him. I know, but because he was always making fun of Feeny, who was that's almost why it didn't make sense to me. I was like, wait, you're not going to say why would I help you? You never helped me with anything. His whole point, I guess he's going back to the opening scene. He's so protective of Feeny, which is very cute. He's like, no, you never helped the other teacher. I guess that's it. You never help the the teacher never gets any help from you. Why would you you now as the teacher get any help from me? Um, But I don't know how anybody in the scene could possibly pay attention to anything other <laughs> anything than, other than, than me. Me. I don't wow. know how we even got this scene through. So it was so uh. distracting to me and it's such a great scene. And yet I was like, meatloaf, meat feeny. Um, okay. So Corey then walks up to the front of the class and he talks about how prejudice is still happening in today's world. He tells the story of Linda crying in their living room and Corey is talking and he's trying to get a word in edgewise, but nobody's paying any attention to him. The Too whole busy class throwing is just, those paper balls throwing like you paper do. Stains, like bouncing you do. on balls yoga <sighs> um and uh only feeny is really paying attention to what he is saying as Corey is about to walk out of the classroom he says you know i give up you're right you win and as he's about to walk out he turns around to ask sean what his mom's name was before she got married and then he calls sean a racial or a derogatory term and and that stayed in and that stayed in the episode. That unlike the other, the reason. other term that was cut from the Linda. So scene. the original line, I think almost verbatim was something like, until my brother came home with his girl, came home with his new girlfriend who was crying because some jerk called her a G word at the mall. Right. That yeah. was the line. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I remember and it. Yeah. Me too. And Ben mispronounced the word. At uh, at the table read, and they took it out, and I think you're right. It, it and but I'm I'm so curious. So why do you think that do you think that that that's actually where they wrote in the anti semitism semitism oh. semitism joke? I wonder if that was inspired Maybe. by the fact that Ben actually did mispronounce the G word, and therefore because that it's it's yes. a really nice moment. Yeah, when, with the semitism se- semitism, I, I was like, whoa. And yeah. it, I, it was. I wonder what came first, you know? But we you're definitely right. all remember Ben mispronouncing the word, Absolutely. and the writers being. Very very happy that he like I remember the adults being like that's cool that Ben doesn't know this word right. and I didn't either you know I remember yeah, yeah it's so fascinating yeah um, I, you know what that's a really good point writer and I would not be surprised if that's exactly why because I do remember and why did we know that why do we why do we remember because I remember so clearly the adults saying and re- and reacting to it's actually great that he's that he doesn't yeah. know how to say this yeah. word yeah. and that he doesn't know it yeah and like, I'm sure Michael what, made a speech about it yeah, yeah, I'm sure right. Michael took, yeah. took a note session sure. or right. took a moment to like, you know, yeah. give us all this like lecture about how awesome this is, which yeah. it is. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. OK, because so, you're right. That is a really good moment where he mispronounces anti-Semitism and, and uh, Feeney corrects him. Mm-hmm. Sean gets offended by the term that Corey has just called him. He gets up, he gets into his face and, and Corey is trying to prove a point related to Anne Frank. And now suddenly everyone in the class kind of stops what they're doing and turns and pays attention. And you are nine feet tall rider. You yeah, are you nine so feet tall. tall when you stand next to Corey. I was amazed. I'm like, Oh my, he's towering over him. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not by a the tall way, guy Will, in real life. Better late than never. Never. Those balls are called monster balls or hopper ball. Okay, there we go. All right. So that's what those that's what those those balls were. So we continue on in Mr. Feeney's classroom after our our break. Feeney is grading. He's grading papers and he says that some people. Hold on. I just wanted to comment on how good that scene is. By the way, I mean, it's 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 heavy handed. Yeah. But I think correctly so. And I think that for watching it with Indy, there was a real change of temperature in the room Mm. and Indy 
kept checking with me, like, what's happening? Is this okay? Wow. Is this okay that, that, that you're going to fight Corey or that Corey's going to be, te- you know, it was like the tone completely drops and mm. changes into a different mode. And it was that sort of boy meets world special yeah. sauce, you yeah, know, yeah, where yeah. I was like watching my son realize something really important was going on and that Corey was doing something really as, and, and he wanted to know about Anne Frank. Yeah. You know, he wanted to, he was like, wait, who died? Who died? But when Ben says that, you know, a 15 year old girl died, he's like, what? Right. Who died? And I was like, keep, just keep watching, buddy. And yeah. then sure enough, he's like, this girl who wrote this book died. And uh, yeah, so I, I think it was incre- it's an incredibly effective, you know, because the the hijinks, right, of swapping with the teacher. I'm going to teach. The, it's yeah. a, it is the most sitcom sure. situation, right? Yeah. It is yeah. like, oh, the kid's going to teach. The teacher's going to be wearing meatloaf. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. And then to really pull the rug out from under the audience and to, 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 deliver this incredible speech. It was wonderful. And and I also just, I appreciate that there's two speeches, right? Like Ben tries, Corey tries yeah. and fails. And I think I, there was a point when he's walking out of the class where he's like, okay, I give up, you win. I thought for a moment, I was like, was that, is that going to be the end of the scene? Yeah. Like you could just end the scene there. Like Corey yep. learned his lesson, you know? Right. But, but instead to have this extra speech this other speech where he goes again he makes it personal to sean and then gets up there that was beautiful it's it's yeah. it's like a really effective moment it's heavy-handed like i said and yeah. you know we can argue whether you know a sitcom should be addressing things like this but i i found it incredibly effective and my and i could tell indy was really rattled by it in a good way i think the th- one of the lines that i loved more than anything else in the episode was when Corey says, the problem is that when, when I said that term that I shouldn't have said, the problem is that only one person jumped up. Yeah. Yeah. We all should jump up. Everyone should have jumped up because that really is certainly, I mean, that was the lesson that we were trying to teach with Boy Meets World in 1993. And yet think of how much in the last several years, especially the dialogue has been, it isn't enough to just be you know, not to just not be racist yourself. It it is, you actually have to go above and beyond that. You have to actually be aggressively anti-racist and you should, if you see it happening to somebody else, it doesn't mean that it's not affecting you. That needs to be a problem to you. And yet here, that was exactly the lesson in the classroom that I just said something. And the only person who jumped up was the one person I said it to, as opposed to everybody saying, how dare you say that? We don't say that here. That's not right. Um, And so that's the line that really like stuck out to me the most about the scene is I just thought Mm. it was was such a a poignant lesson for a show in 1993 to be getting trying to get across to kids and families yeah well it's not just that it's also there's times and we we dealt with this a lot in the 90s you know we're younger and you don't you also at times don't realize that you can be part of the problem yes and that's one of the things that trina brought up and has mm-hmm. talked about and that we have all discussed with her. And I can't wait to actually have a deeper conversation with her about it, but not really, you know, for myself, not realizing that, I, you know, I had said stupid, insensitive things at times thinking that I wasn't doing anything wrong. And right. that was kind of par for the course at the time. You yeah. just didn't know. You thought you were having a total conversation with a good friend or you thought you were making a joke or you thought you were doing something that had no racial undertones whatsoever. Until then, somebody sits you down and goes like, no, you, we got to talk about this, which we did. And we're going to again because I know she's coming on soon. But I, I, we couldn't have this conversation without mentioning that, I think, because it was yeah. important. We should also um, mention, it's a great time to mention, this was a very white cast. Yeah. A very <laughs> yep. large no white cast. Yep. And white writing staff. And a white <laughs> writing staff. Yeah. White, white, uh, white yeah. everything. White yes. everything. We had, it was not, it was not a, a, a racially diverse no. set in any way, shape or form. Correct. Um, yep. And that, all that stuff matters. So this is, you know, these are things that we, it was, it, there's the, the interesting kind of, of balance between addressing certain problems on the show that weren't actually being addressed on the show 
Yes. Makes sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, you yeah, know, addressing them societally without really also looking at our, our yeah, actual environment or ourselves or any of that kind of stuff. And so I'm, you know, I, I, I can't wait to have Trina on the show because, well, we, 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 we've talked conversation. about the, we've talked about the death chair and we've talked about it as kind of a joke, but the truth was also they were trying to diversify the show. They were the, yeah. the, the main reason the death chair existed was, was because we wanted to have a non white best friend for Corey. I remember that that was uh, expressly, you know, we went through multiple black young actors um, and obviously it didn't happen, which is, you know, not great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would have yeah. been nice. Would have been yeah. nice to have a little more diversity in that cast. Yeah. And that didn't happen until Trina. Until Trina yep. joined us. So Which that was what? Season, season five? Season five, yeah. yeah. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. I can't wait to talk with Trina. We will talk in yeah. depth with her and she'll be coming up in a in a few weeks. So I can't wait to get to that. Um, Feeney grades the papers and says that some people still failed the test, but a lot of people did well. Sean actually got a full grade higher than he normally does. He got a B. And I thought, the first thing I thought was, it's very inappropriate for you to be sharing his grade, even that's with like his best friend. The third time that's happened for <laughs> Feeney. Feeney will do that too. He'll be I like, well, you know, that one episode was like, well, Mr. Johnson got an F. Like, wow, why are you getting are you sharing that with people? Feeney, God, have some fun. privacy. That's funny. That didn't yeah, fit me I at all. I thought of it. I was like, that is, <laughs> even though it's too. a good yeah. thing, I thought, yeah. no. Um, yeah. All so, you had to do was throw out a racial slur and Sean gets better grades. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> and do we, we can do it every week. <laughs> but that's what we, we address this slightly. But why was that racial slur OK, but the other one was cut? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't you know. Right it's yeah, well, that gets into this tricky like degrees of whiteness, right? Like, is that um, what it is? Yeah. I mean, that's. I what mean, it's you know, be, it, well, right? you know, yes. If a hundred hundred years ago, being Italian was non-white. Now, right. you know, then at some point, it sort of got included into whiteness, right? Like, I remember when when we were kids, like at this age, Polish jokes were popular. Oh, huge! Right? Yeah, like absolutely. now you would, and that was like acceptable to say Polish jokes. And of in course. retrospect, I'm like, what? What? Yeah. You right. know, it's so weird. Weird that what what counts is you know yeah it's America's tricky guys America's tricky. It well, do you remember be, right? Oh, go ahead, Dan. No, I was gonna say it could also have been a network thing from the standpoint of one is very obviously used as a teachable moment. I'm not saying that it is whether that's uh, I'm not saying that's a, a correct way to look at it or not. But one, he would have just said by throwing it out there to tell people that that's what someone was called, and the other one was used very pointedly to deliver the message about how wrong it was. So I wonder if there was some varying degrees of we'll only allow this word in this moment because everyone is going to acknowledge how wrong it is right in the moment instead of yes. saying it without Absolutely. really making a big teachable moment out of it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So that also, could have been a deciding Sean factor. is there to react to it where Lindsay's character was not there for her side. Maybe that has something to do with it where it's like mm -hmm. Sean could be the audience surrogate there where you, he gets to step up and actually address it directly where yeah. Yeah, Lindsay's character never did. Right. So maybe that had something to do with it too. Hmm. Quite possibly. So uh, Feeney says that Corey got a great grade as well, even though he didn't take the test, but he actually read the book. And so we get the that great little lesson here that everyone learned. Um, and then we are back in the Matthews living room. Eric walks in and says he has a date with a cheerleader. Amy says she really liked Linda. Why, why are you not still dating Linda? And um, Eric says, Linda is the cheerleader. And she made the squad. Amy says she used to be a cheerleader and she gets up to do her, her cheer. And this is a really the first like Amy Betsy yes. showcase. Yep. Yep. Yeah. She gets to do a bit. I she totally gets, did not remember this. At all. I remember. I this. remembered it I, the minute it started. Did you really? I had yeah. no recollection of this. And then when remember, Lindsay comes in in the outfit, I was like, what? How do I not remember this? It's so I funny. actually remembered the the actual the, words to it and before it so, happened i turned to my wife and i was like it's bobo skidin don't like i yeah. knew some of it <laughs> um, i did too so, i remembered yeah. it very well I did not. Uh, it so was fun. very salient to me for some reason and eric says that her cheer is cute dated but cute and linda walks in she's in her uniform and eric says all right show my mom what they're doing these days and linda does her cheer which of course very funny is the exact same cheer that amy had just done and eric calls her cheer cutting edge 
And I love this. Indy was like, it's the same. <laughs> and then he was like, what does cutting edge mean? <laughs> like, immediately. What does cutting edge mean? But uh, think Will, about for you, an are, oh, you in this scene, I wrote down, oh, Will is channeling Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, yeah. the look on your face at the end when you're like, yeah, it's cutting edge. And then you're like giving your Give mom this. So- I, it was such like Michael J. Fox caught in an awkward moment. It was wow. great. I was like, wow, this is so funny. Like I could see, because you definitely looked up to Michael J. Fox. Oh, at, man. At that, yeah. Yes. Huge. He's like the the gold standard of teenage sitcom, act- sitcom, sitcom acting. Sitcom actors. And Heck you, yeah. I, I, I was like, oh, wait, he even sounds like him. He looks like him. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Michael J. Fox beat. It was great. Oh, I will take that. I remember. Yeah thinking i can't remember when we shot this like i can't remember if we shot this at before the audience this would have been after the audience left because you yeah. were all over 18, all over 18. but then over i yeah 16 so you could have stayed an extra hour you but know. i remember thinking that's why i don't remember it probably because i was already gone went, Lindsay went from crying scene to hey great scene now get into your cheerleading outfit <laughs> And come do that. Like, okay, now we're going to clean up your makeup and clean up right. your face again. And now you're a happy cheerleader. Like, wow, that was, that might've been a half an hour later, an hour later that we did yeah. that. Right. So yeah, it's crazy. Well, I mean, what a great episode. Um, great job all around everybody. Oh, I also yeah. forgot to mention, this is such a silly little thing. And I keep talking so much about the clothes, but the first time we see Topanga in the classroom, she's also wearing the same dress she was wearing in the kiss scene in the hallway, yes. that purple lace dress. Oh, okay. yes. And then in this scene, in, in the script, Ben is wearing the same suit. And I thought at some point we definitely hit where we never rewore outfits. Like if you wore something once, you oh, then no, I, wore, I rewore it. outfits all the time. Really? So did, so did oh yeah. yeah. People so people I. point out people like have tweeted at me or whatever like all this like what's up with this shirt and I'm like oh yeah I remember wearing that shirt multiple times like I always rewore outfits constantly. Well, I just want Bill to rewear his meatloaf shirt. Oh. I I would do anything <laughs> for that for that Hashtag to come meat back. Feeny. Hashtag meat feeny. You know what? Let's make a meat feeny shirt. Let's yes. do it. Meat feeny. We'll we'll just we'll <laughs> so offer it for shirts. a week. Every episode <laughs> you know, that's of this also, podcast we come up with another shirt. <laughs> Too much shirts. You know, there's also a, uh, a, you know, a shirt that's out there that's Bill. Uh, it's Mr. Feeney with his arms crossed. And it says, I was just hanging with my homies. That's like a famous <laughs> shirt. And that comes from this episode where he oh, writes right. in and he goes, I didn't I'm just hanging that. with my homies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, oh that's cute. where that's from. That's where that's from. That's yeah. cute. Well, good. I'm glad I know that now because I have seen that shirt and didn't know where it was from. So now I know. Yeah, I didn't know either. So thank you all for joining us. Join us next week. We are going to take Q and A's. We're going to do a Q and A <gasps> episode. So we're not going to take A's. We're going to give you A's, but we're taking your Q's. <laughs> 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 and uh, it's going to be really fun. You guys have been so responsive and so um, welcoming and you've been great with your feedback. So we're going to do an entire episode dedicated to answering some of your questions. Uh, thank you here for being with us. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at pod meets world show. Uh, you can email us at pod meets world show at gmail.com. And as we mentioned, we've got too much shirts at pod meets world show.com. Merch. You get your merch. Um, merch. I, I can't wait to get my too much shirts shirt. I ordered it. It's on its way to me. Did you uh, really? I did. Yeah. I got to learn how to use the computer. Well, we have one coming for you. Don't worry. Yes. I knew you weren't going to know how awesome. to order one. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Can't wait to see you next week. We love you all. Pod dismissed. Pod Meets World is an iHeart podcast produced and hosted by Daniel Fischel, Will Friedle, and Ryder Strong. Executive producers, Jensen Karp and Amy Sugarman. Executive in charge of production, Danielle Romo. Producer and editor, Tara Sudbach. Producer, Lorraine Vurez. Engineer and Boy Meets World superfan, Easton Allen. Our theme song is by Kyle Morton of Typhoon. Follow us on Instagram at Pod Meets World Show or email us at Pod Meets World Show at gmail.com.